If we change the state of Texas, we will change the country. I know it. Texas is now considered a battleground state. The Lone Star State has been a Republican juggernaut the last 40 years, and now polls show a close race there. Texas is in the midst of a population boom and a demographic sea change. The stereotype that Texans only look one way, they only have one religion, they only talk one way, like that, that's from 20 or 30 years ago. Look around you. We are every color, race, creed, religion. And overwhelmingly, the fastest growth is among Hispanics, who now make up 38% of the state's population. Hispanics will be the largest single group in Texas by 2020. Today, we welcome the pushback filmmaker, Kevin Ford, who will join us in conversation and share exclusive clips from the film. Welcome, Kevin. How are you? I'm good. Uh, you know, it's always a little challenging with these Zoom connections, but I'm, I'm feeling the love, so thanks for being here. <laughs> Can you just give me a little brief overview of the film and what was the impetus? Why Texas? Well, I lived in Texas for 10 years, 2004 to 2014. And before I lived there, I was born and raised in California. Later, I lived in New York. Uh, ended up in Austin, Texas. And when I moved there, the place really surprised me. The people I met, I met some of the most progressive and diverse people in the whole country while living in Texas. But before I lived there, I didn't have that perception of it. I honestly just thought of it as a red state, stereotyped it as being a place that was just kind of full of racists and cattle or something. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just kind of what I thought of it before living there. Living there turned that perception on its head and I've always had a deep love for it. And then even though I don't live there anymore, it's fascinating to me how people still think of Texas that have never had that experience. So a big part of it was I wanted to show people the diversity of that state. And I was inspired by what was happening in 2018 in the, in the run-ups to the midterm elections. My bigger picture thought was, if we can show that that's what's happening in Texas, imagine all the other places that we think uh, a mm -hmm. certain way, and maybe as a nation, we're in the process of redefining ourselves. The film could show that. I deeply believe that Texas is the bellwether of the future of the country. So as you were filming this, what surprises do you have? I mean, the biggest surprise I had probably, in a sense, maybe it would be what I saw down at the border, specifically with a family of ranchers that was fighting to stop the border wall from from taking their family land. It was just very surprising to me because I thought, yes, like here these guys are just fighting to keep this border wall from destroying their land. And then their neighbors who are the National Butterfly Center also trying to stop the wall from destroying the environment of the region. So I, when I set out, I didn't actually think it was gonna be so much of, about this wall. And that really mm -hmm. surprised me because the thing is, over the course of time, the administration kept focusing on that and they kept mm -hmm. making that an issue. Eminent domain, the seizure of private land by the government, that is usually protected by Republican wherewithal. And in this case, eminent domain seems not to understand that this was something that was a basic level, just like gun rights is right up there with this idea that not on my land. And so what you highlight, I think, is not only important, but I also think that it speaks to the hypocrisy we oftentimes see right now in how the government chooses what to espouse when it comes to party line and American doctrine, so to speak. It's important. We, we show uh, the National Butterfly Center, we show the ranchers, but all the way up in Dallas, we've got progressive clergy members fighting for racial justice up there. We, as far out as East Texas, you've got Joe Lansdale, an author who's trying to address racism through his writings and through his storytelling. El Paso, uh, the congresswoman, is a huge part of the movie. You've also got um, Natasha Harper Madison in Austin trying to talk about the legacy of racism in that city and how it, how it is being dealt with right now, how she's trying to fight 
for that. Mm -hmm. So what I found was all across the state, there was so many different people, not just politicians, Mm -hmm. activists, everyday citizens, in some cases, artists, everybody kind of pushing back in their own way. And that was what I was really hoping to show. There's so many people out there that you're, to your point, is that people are fighting and it's not the electeds always, it's the people that are giving some of the electeds the courage to do the right thing. Uh, But also the recalculation of people who are putting their skin in the game that perhaps said politics wasn't for me. And so with that, I would love to uh, bring in Beto O'Rourke and Congresswoman Escobar into the conversation so we can discuss what this film was and the impact it has and, and why is Texas a battleground state? Well, while we wait for Beto to start his video, um, I guess I'll fill some air time uh, and answer your question. Uh, but first, I, I want to thank everybody who's watching and everybody who uh, made this film. Hey, Beto! Talk a little bit about your experience in the film, but also what is at stake in this election? And Beto, I want to get you into the conversation as well. You know, there's so much at stake in this election, Maria Teresa. And, and I first want to say hey to Kevin and to Beto and to you, of course, and to everybody watching. Before we went on the air, I was sharing with, with you and with Kevin that when I watched the film for the first time, it was uh, a really emotional event because it was reliving a lot of what El Paso lived through uh, over the course of the last couple of years, or at least over the course of about a year and a half. And seeing it, you know, the, the, we all lived it. And I, and I want to say really the star of the film to me is El Paso in the beautiful way that our community responded with open arms, with open heart, um, with open minds, with so much love. And to me, that, that, that is the, the heart of, of what the film is about, that in the face of incredible cruelty, there is this community that has been long maligned by outsiders that keeps responding with nothing but love. And it is precisely what makes Texas a battleground state, is communities like El Paso that have had to bear witness to cruelty, that have had to respond to cruelty, that have had to act with courage in the face of cruelty, that have said enough. Um, You know, there's the, the, I've been canvassing uh, by phone. We've, we've been doing all sorts of phone banks uh, now for some time. I've spoken to, to so many people and the vast majority, I think, of folks understand what's at stake. But there are still some for whom you have to make the case. But Texas is absolutely winnable this election. It is absolutely flippable. Um, We saw in 2016 Hillary Clinton come within nine percentage points of beating Donald Trump with zero resources in the state. We saw in 2018 Beto O'Rourke come within two percentage points of giving Texans back the seat that is currently occupied by Ted Cruz. You also saw city councils flip, uh, judicial positions flip, commissioner's courts flip, congressional districts flip. 2020 is Texas year. And as I had said to Kevin one day that it was recorded, when you change Texas, you change the country. As of this morning, at least, you know, our small organization, Voto Latino, we have officially registered in Texas 229,099 people since January 1. We are on track to register 260,000 today. We cannot wait. Uh, We're closing that effort. And we're going to mobilize 1.6 million Texans, low propensity voters. But that is because there is an appetite by people like they are you can only register people if they want to be registered if they are paying the call, attention to the call of democracy speak to that Beto speak to that energy and how the film yeah. captures it yeah absolutely so you know, I, I love what Veronica just had to say because you know Kevin did such a good job of, of capturing the consequence of the cruelty of Donald Trump mm-hmm. and and nowhere do you do you see that and nowhere is there a, a closer perspective than in, in El Paso or in Texas or on the U.S.-Mexico border. And at the same time, uh, the ability to capture what gives us hope despite the darkness and the struggle and the suffering that so many are going through. And, you know, I know this is probably not easy for Veronica to hear, but, but Veronica represents that for, for so many of us. This, this is the antidote to that cruelty and that failure in leadership. This is the hope that we have in a community like El Paso, in, in a state like Texas, we are going to overcome this. 
And when you look at Voto Latino, 260,000 voter registrations. When I lost to Ted Cruz by 215,000 votes, you just registered more people than was the margin in the last Senate race. Y además, and in addition, you have an additional 1.5 million registered just since the last presidential race. There's a, a brand new electorate in Texas. It is young, it is increasingly Latino and, and Latina, and it is trending democratic. It, it, it will be, there, there's this beautiful, poetic and political justice in all this, that the most voter suppressed state in the union, that for 144 years has tried to stop black and Latino Texans from exercising their right to vote, might very well be the state on the 3rd of November that saves this country when we overcome those barriers of suppression, when we get past the, the cruelty, the racism, and the intimidation that has been the hallmark of the Trump administration. And this, this film gets you ready for what is about to happen, I hope, in, in 2020, and reminds us that, look, if you just stop at, with your frustration at all the bad things that are happening, then, then you will lose. If, if you look at that eyes wide open and understand what we're up against and take stock and say, you know what, the, the hell with this, we're gonna overcome this. It isn't gonna be easy, it's gonna be a struggle. Some will have to suffer as we make our way through this. But if we don't, then we become somehow complicit in, in what is happening and we're not gonna stand for that. And for me, again, Veronica is that champion who represents that ethic that I find so present in El Paso. And Maria Teresa, as you say, present throughout the state of Texas, unlike any time in my 48 years uh, as, as a Texan. So I, I'm, despite all this, and maybe because of all this and the response to it, I'm very hopeful right now. So Kevin, I wanna bring you into the conversation because I think what folks may not realize is that Texas has 38 electoral votes. It is the game. When we say that the trajectory of the country for the next decade comes through Texas, speaks to that. So when you were creating this movie, did you realize that it could be an F, a rallying cry for get out the vote to flip Texas? Yeah, it was, and obviously I was inspired by you, Beto, and then meeting Veronica. So I was in the wake of what they were already doing. You, you drove all over the state, visited every county. I didn't get that far, but I did drive across the whole state making the film alone in a rental car. And I, I kind of thought, okay, this, this is, I get the vibe. <laughs> and, and, but I, I really, really did believe the whole time, uh, the whole team, we were making the film knowing we wanted to put it out in 2020. So it, it wasn't about the midterms, that was our beginning, that was our jumping off point. And that's, that's where our film begins, but it ends in 2020 with the Congresswoman giving a rebuttal to the State of the Union address. So in every way we designed this thing to basically pass off to, to would-be voters and to say, look at what's happening. For us, it was our, our way of contributing to the democracy. And I'm not running for office, but I thought I could make a film. And, and that's our way of knocking on doors and, and doing different things. Well, and Kevin, it's funny, because I meet so many people and people feel like they, whatever their capacity, that they can't contribute. And I keep asking people, well, what is your, su I, I respond like, well, what is your superpower? Put on that cape. I have a question from the audience. His name is Richard. He wants to know how much of a role did the progressive faith community play in the rise of the next generation of politics in Texas? When you look at the civil rights movement of the 1960s and the power of the pulpit in the deep South to really be central to um, the, the freedom writers and to Dr. King's message, um, in so many ways, faith-based leaders are doing that today on the immigration front and on battling back cruelty. But it does, I will tell you, Maria Teresa, it does go beyond um, any organized faith uh, here in, in El Paso. I mean, it is the web of love, the network of love is so profound and so ingrained in who we are. And I'll give you a super quick example. Uh, Ruben Garcia, as you mentioned, the director of Annunciation House, which has been the leader in, in our region and providing hospitality to vulnerable migrants as they're released from ICE custody. You know, as those numbers were growing, he was reaching out for help. And definitely the churches were, um, you know, sending congregants and, and opening up spaces and being a huge part of the hospitality and the love. But I'll never forget um, on, on Christmas morning, 
um, I, I got a call, I think it was from Ruben, who said, you know, I've got about 300 migrants coming in tonight, and I've got no dinner prepared for them. I've got nothing ready. Um, and I said, don't worry, let me pull together some people. I posted something on Facebook immediately. I was inundated with responses. Um, we put together a quick uh, organization for that night, for Christmas night. That night, on Christmas night, it was the most beautiful yes. Christmas gift that any of us could ever have received to be able to come together to celebrate Christmas with some of the most vulnerable families who were in search for a safe haven. And El Pasoans just came out with food, came out with water, with drinks, you name it. And it was like that for a year. It's been like that for years. It will continue to be like that. That's who El Paso is. And what is beautiful about the story is that what folks don't realize is that they purposely released all these people on Christmas Eve with no place to go. And El pa I was there and El Paso's took the call and it was so beautiful because it was, it was, we, it was rooted again in our faith in many ways. And I think that's what makes it so special. I do want to ask you though, Beto, one of the biggest concerns we have right now is the disenfranchisement actively being done by Greg Abbott, the governor, trying to prevent this rise of an electoral base that deeply believes in democracy. He is now trying to tamp down how many drop boxes are available for people to drop off their values so that they can vote safely under COVID. Can you speak a little bit to that? You have to call it what it is. It, it is mm -hmm. voter suppression. Um, in, in a county like Harris, uh, which has more people than the state of Colorado, more landmass than the state of Rhode Island, to close all those satellite collection sites means that a, an eligible voter who has an absentee ballot, who understandably does not trust the U.S. mails at this moment, might drive 50 miles, 5-0, to, to get, if she has a car, by the way, mm -hmm. to, to get to that drop-off location. He, he is trying to deter her from voting. He's functionally denying her, in some cases, the ability to vote. But I, I gotta tell you, Maria Teresa, there's a, a portrait that Veronica Escobar hung in the uh, county courthouse when she was the El Paso County judge of Dr. Lawrence Nixon. He moved to El Paso at the start of the 20th century he started the first chapter of the NAACP in the entire state of Texas. He started it in El Paso. In 1924, he paid his poll tax, which he had to pay, walked into the fire station, I think it was fire station number 13, his precinct to vote, and was denied the ability to vote based on the color of his skin because in 1923, the Texas legislature passed a law creating the all-white Democratic primary, which just is it's almost hard for me to believe that in the lifetime of those who are still with us, mm -hmm. there was an all white democratic primary by force of law. So as a black man, he was denied the ability to vote. But Dr. Lawrence Nixon took his case to the federal court, ultimately to the Supreme Court of the United States, not once, but twice. And it wasn't until 1944, at the almost end of World War II, as black men, and some black women were, were willingly sacrificing themselves for our democracy, that he was able to walk into that same fire station, number 13, and cast his ballot because the Supreme Court had struck down the all-white Democratic primary, thanks to his courage and tenacity and perseverance. And so I think we've got to acknowledge the voter suppression that, that, is, that, that we're working against right now. Mm -hmm. But if we only say that and we don't mention the, the people like Dr. Lawrence Nixon or John Lewis, uh, you know, who was... Veronica's colleague and mine as, as well, and, and the hero to all of us, th those who, who work to overcome this suppression who, and who should serve as our inspiration, and, and we who are their heirs uh, to the service and sacrifice and struggle that preceded us, you know, then who are we, right? And so let, let's acknowledge that that's happening, but let, let us not allow it to deter us or to depress turnout. Let's just say, look, they, they wouldn't be trying this hard to keep us from voting if, if our votes weren't this important, if we weren't literally about to decide the outcome of the most important presidential race since 1864. So early voting is on October 13th, make a plan to vote. Many counties are creating voter super centers right now. Um, make sure your family, your friends, your colleagues, your classmates, your neighbors, everyone in your life is making that plan to, to vote. So, so let's, let's acknowledge that it's happening 
And let's also now commit ourselves to overcoming it, just like Dr. Lawrence Nixon did. What folks don't realize is that in 2018, Generation X, Y, and Z outvoted older voters. Texas went from the last dead last voter registration participatory state to 41st in a midterm. So you literally leapfrogged other ones. And it was because young people and Latinos outvoted older voters. And that's what's exciting. So Kevin, when you were making this film, did people feel that it was palatable? Did they feel that energy of where Texas was in play? All across the state, that was the energy. I mean, I think right, right, the first people I ever filmed in the movie, uh, some young women, they call themselves Rouser in Austin, Texas. I just hit the streets. They were in the middle at that time of joining uh, protests, but also working to register voters and helping local candidates. And so right off the bat, I was exposed to people who were just doing the work. They were also volunteering for your campaign. Um, it just absolutely amazing. You're pointing to Beto, right? You're pointing yeah, sorry, to Beto. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so that we're um, all clear. Right? Yeah, no, but, and so actually that was where I saw them, I filmed them door knocking, phone banking, and I myself got inspired, went on to do that in my life. So it's contagious. You see, that's the thing is you realize there's a reason that this has been suppressed and downplayed because it's contagious. And when people, when citizens get activated, you can't stop this. And it's, that's what we show in the film all across the state. And that's how both of you are able to do the work you're doing because so many people, once they get the bug, then they want to help and they want to get people involved. So that's that's what the film is about. You know, we have folks that are saying, I'm absolutely in, but we have folks, I think we also have to recognize that COVID has hit the Latino community and in Texas, uh, devastated populations. How do we encourage them? I definitely want to talk about how we encourage them to do it. But I want to acknowledge what you just mentioned, Maria Teresa, about the impact that COVID has had on Latino communities. Thanks in, in, in no small part to Beto, who has been really sounding the alarm nationally about what's been happening uh, on the southern border. You know, many of us have mm -hmm. continued to sound the alarm. And last week, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus had a virtual hearing where we, you know, even though it was, an, it was not an official congressional hearing, it was very much like one, ver you know, via Zoom. Mm -hmm. And we had some great panelists, including an essential worker and physicians uh, like Dr. Fauci, who, you know, heads up the, the task force for the White House. And Dr. Peter Hotez said something that I want to share with everyone. And mm -hmm. I've been repeating it over and over and over again, that in the southern part of the United States, with the way COVID has been disproportionately killing Latinos, that the pandemic is decimating an entire generation of Latinos. He used the word that this is a decimation. And so we have to acknowledge the, the uh, incredible, profound injustice that, that, that occurs in order for Latinos to be victims that way and vulnerable that way. And it is generations of lack of access to health care, generations of poverty, all of which we are seeing promoted still to this day uh, in the White House and in the governor's mansion. And that's exactly why they don't want us to vote. And as Kevin described, the way that it is contagious, once you own your democracy, and once you see the power in the work that you do, it absolutely is inspiring and it forces you to keep going. Um, and so, so we need to build you know, bigger um, opportunities for everybody. And, and to your point, how do we get people to the polls and create that linkage to the polls during a pandemic? The number one thing in my view is information. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many texts, calls, DMs, et cetera, to my personal phone, to my personal Facebook, to my official, to my campaign, the questions that we're getting about how do I vote safely? How do I make sure that I get out there? Will my mail-in ballot be safe? The number one thing we can do is getting uh, uh, people information, empowering them with that. And so we're going to keep doing that until election day. The second thing 
ensure that we create safety at the polls. We know that Donald Trump wants to create chaos. Um, I was on the phone this weekend with our county leaders about a safety plan and about getting that information to the community so that chaos cannot be sown at the polls in El Paso. We have to be doing that every county across the state every state across the land to make sure that that we preserve the safety and security of this election and that we give people the information the third thing we have just got to make sure that people vote early and that they vote the, um, as, as soon as they possibly can, mm -hmm. encourage them to avoid the lines of election day, get that information about early voting out to everybody, make sure that we remove all obstacles and roadblocks, that we have rides to the polls, that we have readily access, accessible information about wait times at the various uh, polling sites. We can take this. Texas can deliver for the future of our democracy. Texas can save our country. Texas can save our future. We are all in this together and I know we can make it happen. Beto, I know that you have traversed all of Texas. You, you know every nook and cranny. Where do you think is the biggest opportunity that the Democratic Party is missing? So I'm, I'm really glad you asked this because we were talking about voter suppression earlier, which if, if that is the greatest sin committed by Republicans, then, then perhaps the greatest sin committed by Democrats is to take those same voters for granted. You're black, you're Mexican American, you're Latino, uh, you live in a, in a minority majority community, we, we can take your vote for granted. We're going to go compete in the suburbs or we're going to go try to win back these Trump voters or whatever, as though that's a mutually exclusive proposition, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, what Veronica has done, and, and Maria Teresa, you're going to love this. And, and Kevin, you, you get a, an idea of the distance. She chartered a bus in 2018 from El Paso to Brownsville. And folks will know that both those cities are on the border. They won't know the, the, the many, many hours and hundreds of miles that separate those two parts of the Texas-Mexico border. And she organized this border bus tour of fronterizos and fronterizas, who wanted to talk to their fellow border residents about the importance of this election. And what we know from the political science of this is the number one reason people give for not voting is they were never asked to vote. And so Veronica literally was gonna physically show up in these communities and ask people to vote and, and do this in English, do this in Spanish, do this with the utmost respect and, and be on your doorstep to do it. This year we couldn't physically do that. So Veronica organized a virtual border bus tour. And for a week, she and I, and, and literally hundreds of volunteers called the border counties of Texas. And Maria Teresa, I was, I was, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm pretty alarmed at the number of people who told me in English and told me in Spanish, I don't know if I'm going to vote this year. Um, I don't know if I vote who I'm going to vote for. And I'm thinking, holy smokes, how, how, how do you not know right now? But to, to, Beto, you have a cleaner, I would have been a potty mouth actually at that response, to be honest. Well, <laughs> He's all one of the, wholesome one the, right now. <laughs> one of the guys I was talking to um, said, hey, you caught me on my shift at, at the Circle K. This may have been in McAllen or in Harlingen. And, you know, remember, in, in Texas, the minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. And when I try to piece together what his day looks like and what his life is like, he may be working two or three of those minimum wage jobs. Right. Following politics is not a luxury this guy can afford. No one's ever reached out to him before. And he said that to me. So I was like, this is the first political call I've ever gotten in my life. Yeah. And he's like, I got to get back to work, but thank you for calling. I don't know if I'm going to, if I'm going to vote. I don't know if I've got time for this right now. And, and so Democrats and, and look, present company excluded, but the Democrats have to do a much better job. And you ask Maria Teresa, where, where are these opportunities? The Rio Grande Valley, Laredo, uh, Star County, El Paso, but also, and, and you all know this, Lubbock. And Amarillo, mm -hmm. we think of these panhandle parts of Texas as reliably red or overwhelmingly white. They are not. Look at the public schools, look at the younger generations in these communities, increasingly Latino, Mexican American, um, and, and no one has ever reached out to them. Again, present company excluded. So I, I'm, I'm making an appeal, and I know uh, Veronica is, and, and I hope given your reach, Maria Teresa, you, you are as well, to the Biden campaign, do not take these voters for granted. Do not take mm -hmm. Texas for granted. Um, this state can deliver the victory for you on election night. It can end our national nightmare. 
It can deny Trump the ability to prolong this in, in the courts and to test the Constitution. And it will be these Latino voters, by and large, in a state that has 5.6 million eligible Latino voters. No state comes even close to that in terms of swing states, in terms of that large of a Latino electorate. And, and we cannot blame this one on Republicans, right? It's going to be up to Democrats as to whether or not we lose them. And if the top of the ticket will not take this seriously, um, then I'm afraid we'll lose, despite the best efforts of those who are on this call right now. So we will do our part, but, but we really need to appeal to the Biden campaign to come in and give this the full respect and give Texas its due if we're going to win. You go to those interactive electoral college maps and you poke around and you get to some of the states where it's like, that's kind of a toss up. Any one of those, you go over to Texas, you click it, game over. The election yep. is done and it, it's mind boggling. So let's do it. From the work that we've been doing now, Texas is closer to flip than Florida. Yep. There is a, just a different sensibility. So Kevin, in these conversations, while you were having these conversations, was anything that you saw showing what the Democratic Party perhaps was not doing? Don't take anyone for granted. There are people in our film, there's a, a retired border patrol agent who has had enough of Trump and he lays out the case standing right down there at the border wall of why he thinks that was a terrible idea and it's not gonna work. And he has had enough of the crazy. So even he as a guy, someone might not think he's a voter for, you know, that, that Biden could get, but he sure as heck has had enough of Trump. Veronica, I wanna ask you, for the person that feels tired, the person that, you know, the, the guy working at the Circle K, how do we tell him that his vote will help change not just the country, but his immediate present. Uh, Maria Teresa, that's exactly the conversation that we're having on these calls. Um, I am pouring my own campaign resources uh, to reaching out to those low propensity Democratic voters who are exhausted because they've got other things to worry about. They've got to worry about how they're going to pay college tuition. They've got to worry about losing their job as a result of COVID. They've got to, the, the moms, who, who, single moms who have to worry about how they uh, homeschool their kids, multiple children in a one bedroom apartment. I mean, I, I hear from constituent after constituent, you know, during my day job and then during phone banking here, you know, th these low propensity democratic voters basically say, look, you know, I, I, th th I'm too busy for this or, or, or what has uh, the government ever done for me? You know, and, and so those are conversations that you end up tailoring in each call. And so, you know, you begin with conversations about healthcare, you know, as that is the universal, you know, if, if people were healthier, it immediately changes their economic situation. If they had access to primary health care, if they had the safety net of, of health insurance. With younger people, it's definitely been about the environment, those conversations and about the, the absolute climate emergency that we face. The most challenging conversations I will share with you are with single issue folks. The folks for whom there is one singular issue and, and you know, that's it. Um, and so it's talking those folks away from that singular issue and getting them to think about the whole of their life, the whole of their future, the whole of their community. But reaching out to the low propensity Dem voters, these are the toughest conversations either at the door or on the phone. They take a lot longer. You, you really have to talk through things with people. You, you have to listen, yeah. but that's democracy. Beto, I wanna ask you, and then I wanna ask you, Congresswoman, what needs to happen right now? What do we need to do in the next 27 days? You know, uh, liking stuff on Twitter, donating to candidates, all that has its place, but, but the, the grind, of mm -hmm. making phone calls, or some of us are starting to knock on doors. Um, it's not easy, and, and no one, I mean, not, not everyone wants to get your phone call, right? They're, they're having dinner, uh, you may have gotten the wrong number. It, it, it's a strange conversation to just, there's two things you're not supposed to discuss in polite company, politics and religion, and you're gonna call a complete stranger about one of them and introduce yourself. So I, I would never say that it's fun, um, but, but I cannot think of anything more necessary. If, if it were easy to turn Texas blue, this would have happened already, right? It was supposed to magically happen demographically, and it's not going to magically happen demographically. Right. It's going to happen through hard work. And, and if, you, if you want to join Veronica in what she's doing, or we have a group called Powered by People, 
that's making voter contact and now get out the vote calls. Join us. And, and again, not easy, not fun, but you will be fulfilled and you will on the night of November 3rd look back without regret and say, you know what, I gave this mile. Not only did I vote, not only did I get everyone in my household to vote, but I made a few hundred phone calls and, and talked to these Texans and got them engaged in their democracy. I called that guy at the Circle K and, and gave him a second to think about whether or not maybe he does want to vote this year. Maybe this is something he should be paying attention to. So um, g give it your all because um, th there's not been a more important election in our lifetimes. And there's not a more important state to decide the outcome of the future of this country than this one uh, because of everything that, that we shared today and everything that Kevin was able to document in his movie. So thank you for asking me to be a part of this. Huge, huge honor. Thank you. Thank you. And Congresswoman, what can they do in the next 27 days? The only thing that, that I will add to, to what Bethel mentioned, mm -hmm. number one, definitely share information. You know, my campaign's gonna be putting out all sorts of information about where to vote, how to vote safely, what information to arm yourself with. So get informed and share it widely. You can also help us phone bank. You can volunteer um, to drive people to the polls safely and securely. Here's the goal. Here's our goal. On November 4th, we want to wake up completely hoarse. Our voice is gone because we've talked to so many voters. We are exhausted because we've worked our asses off and we're hung over <laughs> like we've never been hung over before because we've celebrated flipping Texas. So <laughs> that's our goal. <laughs> and I love that. And with that, I want to thank both Beto and Congresswoman. Thank you for participating. And uh, we are going to be asked where we were during this time. The least we can do is vote because you want to be able to look in the eyes of the next generation that you were present and that you did something about it. So thank you for the work that you are all doing, for the groundwork you're doing, for the inspiration that you have every day, for your energy, but more importantly, you're taking the fight to them. So grateful for the work that Love you're both you. doing. Yeah. Bye guys, be well. <laughs> and Kevin, I wanna bring you back into the conversation and talk a little bit about a clip that we have ready for you. Take a listen guys. Just now, just now. I said, wait a minute, I gotta take care of my people from Texas. I got to go, I don't even wanna hear about it. of cruelty, politics that have ripped children from the arms of their mothers, politics of cruelty that have imprisoned children in tents in Tornillo. And if we were not angry, what would that say about us? What do we do with that energy? And it is what we do with it that makes us different. So Wesley United is one of the most historical churches in the corridor. This particular big, beautiful church, they have the benefit of having right now this plaque that recognizes people who were um, lynched. On August 14th, 1894, Travis County was the site of a triple lynching where a white mob seized a black woman and two black men from a small jail about 30 miles from Austin. A mob of armed white men abducted the three prisoners from the jail, tied them to stakes in a nearby field and riddled them with gunshots, killing all three. The woman and two men were very likely innocent of any crime. Pretty frequently, I put people off because I talk about racism and segregation, um, both from a race perspective and economic perspective, you know. But you have to say it. If you don't talk about it, you don't fix it. Well, those are two different scenes from different parts of the film. But I you know, picked those to share today because I think it shows the passion, um, the emotion of both women, the political strength um, of Congresswoman Escobar, but also Natasha Harper Madison. So that's just it. You know, we're, we're not pulling any punches. These are not people dancing around the issues. They're both just saying it like it is and, and in that inspiring all of us, you know, and, and, and those, those two people, we have an amazing ensemble of people from all over the state of Texas. 
but those two in the edit really became our lead characters. Well, and I think that you were able to contrast uh, two areas, right? Because El Paso is more of a rural area and Austin is just more dense, right? And so I think you were able to get the two sensibilities. Listening to the energy for both from Beto and from Veronica Escobar, what sense do you have, your film will have on others that are maybe tuning in for the set first time? Maybe the guy at the Circle K, what's your hope? Honestly, I hope that the film breaks down a big wall to participating in our democracy. I think it is something that feels other to, as Beto described, to some people who are working and they're tired and they're exhausted and they're short on cash and everything is, is challenging. And so what does politics have to do with me? What has everything to do with you? And, and it's, it's how, it's one of the levers you're being controlled by. Unless we wake up and take our power back, in the movie, in the pushback, you see so many different people reclaiming their power in their own way. I wanna mention there's a grandmother, Ann Finch. She's not sitting back retired. She's from Austin. She's driving down and helping asylum seekers, bringing them food, bringing them water, helping with an amazing group of other volunteers. These are people that are getting involved in life. And that's what's on the ballot right now. Do we want to be involved? Do we want to have pride in our country? Do we want to show humanitarianism? Or do we want to just kind of backslide and go even deeper into a chasm of division that we will never, ever recover from? Oftentimes I hear folks say, well, you know, the system is rigged. And I remind them, Kevin, that the system works as it should for the people who occupy it. And the voters are the ones who occupy the voting booth and put those people in power. There are more like-minded people such as us, as was depicted in the film, who are finally speaking truth. And sometimes that truth is what is needed when we're not clear. But it's when we occupy that voting booth that we can make great change. And Kevin, what would you recommend someone to do besides watching your film right after we finish this discussion? Uh, what would you recommend someone to do right after this? Double check your voter registration, but get involved, um, participate, uh, t talk to people, break down those walls. Um, I've spent a lot of time doing that, and I think it's the best thing that we can do is just is just engage people and get them to care. And I understand that it's that's hard to do. That is the work. But other than well, that, and that's by design, right? If someone is fighting so hard to suppress your vote, it's because they see your power. We've made the website itself kind of a hub for voter engagement tools. We've got links to the different volunteer groups that are in the film, including mm -hmm. Powered by People. So people can kind of go to the website, and if they feel inspired by the film, they can kind of click and get involved. We also just launched an extensive YouTube channel mm -hmm. that takes the film further and expands it out into areas that we weren't able to squeeze into 90 minutes. We've got new content that we're going to be rolling out, updates with our characters. I watch documentaries all the time and I think, I wonder what's going on with them now. So on our YouTube channel, we're taking you there and we're doing follow-ups. Uh, we just did our first one with some of the characters in the film. So in every way, I would say, please also keep checking back with us. And we're going to be posting as much information to, to make sure that you could just go there and be linked and get connected to all of the things that the film is pushing and, you know, ways that you can get involved. Well, Kevin, I feel so uh, grateful that you allowed me to be part of your premiere. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And more importantly, thank you for sharing your talent. Thank you to you and your team for putting on your superhero cape and making sure that people are, sound, are hearing the sound that Texas is not only in play, but that every single vote will matter and get involved.